Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Brad Brightkites, and I'm going to be moderating the session for the next uh, 45 minutes. So we will be ending right around the 11.15 mark to let you get to your uh, future sessions. Um, if you have technical issues during this, please let me know. Uh, just private chat me, and I'll try and help resolve them the best I can. Um, just a reminder, there is a notes section for this that I will be putting in the chat just afterwards. You're free to, free to pop in and uh, help curate the notes for the session there. And uh, I would just like to welcome and introduce Mark Van Ryzen, who will be giving us uh, a wonderful uh, addressing the ac student academic and social emotional needs during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you, Mark, and uh, take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, welcome everyone. I sure appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to, uh, to come and join us. Um, we're gonna try and have a conversation uh, as, as well as we can, given the limited uh, time that we have and the limited um, uh, opportunities we have to get to know one another. That's, that's always one of my favorite things to do. But given the fact that we only have 45 minutes, we're probably going to jump right into it here as, as much as I um, reluctantly um, would, would advocate for that. I would much rather spend time getting to know everyone, but we will have opportunity for conversation. So uh, I'm at the University of Oregon currently, and I've been doing research on a um, typical form of small group instruction called peer learning or cooperative learning. And I'm going to be talking about that a bit today and how that can help to address some of the problems that have uh, been brought up by the pandemic. We're only going to be able to touch on some of the high level things today. Uh, and so I have additional resources uh, available for folks that would like to get in touch with me afterwards. So I put my email address here on, on this page for folks that would like to get in touch with me later. And I'm happy to work with yourself or with uh, um, staff that you're aware of or le school leaders, what, whatever, to, um, to make use of some of these ideas and, and these techniques. So let's jump right into it. Um, let's see if I can make this work. I come from a school of thought that learning is very social. And uh, I think there's a lot of evidence to back that up. A lot of what happens in the classroom is based upon the quality of the relationships that are there. And uh, the positive social connection that a teacher is able to establish with their students and the students are able to establish with one another uh, creates a phenomenon called inducibility. And I'm sure that you've seen this, uh, folks who have worked with kids or who are parents if you have a stronger relationship with someone, if there is more trust, um, then they're more open to your influence. Uh, they're more open to um, working with you, to listening to you, um, to, uh, to taking your uh, advice, uh, all sorts of things that a, that a teacher tries to do in a classroom. And uh, the, the establishment of these relationships is extremely important. However, a lot of times uh, as teachers, what we see when we are doing virtual instruction is something like this, uh, a real lack of engagement, a real lack of sharing, a lack of trust uh, among students. And so the question is, wh what, why is this? Why do we see this from students? And I'm curious uh, among folks here who are educators, what has been your experience? Have you seen this in your virtual classrooms over the past year? And do you have any sense of, uh, of the, the nature of this? Um, can I speak? Absolutely, please just fire away. Okay, um, so I teach adults ESL at Vancouver Island University, and we transitioned to online learning in May last year. And so my experience with the adults is that they're very happy to show their faces and to be engaged and, they actually find Zoom to be like a buffer where mm. if they're shy, they're, they're less shy on Zoom. But I also am a public school educator and I've been teaching students in China, high school students. Oh, and, wow. And I see a lot of this black screen with them. <laughs> and some one of the reasons is because um, they are in classrooms that are very noisy. Mm -hmm. um, so like they're all situated in one kind of noisy classroom where it's too mm. noisy for them to turn on their mics and there's too much going on for them to turn on their video. So mm. that's that's the main reason, but also probably because they're a bit shy as well. Right. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Sometimes there's a lot of chaos in student environments and that's definitely a challenge. Anyone else like to share an experience as an educator? I, 
I can share. Uh, my name's Amanda. I'm an e-learning program coordinator up here in Ottawa. And so Welcome. I'm delivering asynchronous e-learning uh, to students across our province. And so the kids that we have in our classroom might be in Toronto or they might be hundreds of kilometers away and we've never met them. And so it is sometimes challenging to engage them, particularly at the beginning, like the mm -hmm. first week, how do yep. we get buy-in when yep. like you're just an avatar, you're just a dot on the screen. <laughs> Um, it, so we've, we've had those challenges as well, even in asynchronous. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I believe it exactly right. Especially at the beginning. I, I think that's, that's really true. Thank you. Uh, any, any other folks like to share? I teach a, a grade eight, uh, virtual class that's, uh, 14 students. Now it was 15, but one went back to brick and mortar. Um, and, the year started off with most of the students with their cameras on. And as the year progresses, mm -hmm. they just turn them off. And, I, you know, I encourage them every day to turn them on. But right now I probably have maybe four or five that actively keep their cameras on it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and a similar thing with, uh, I actually have two kids, one in middle school, one in high school. Uh, and that's their experience as well, is that a lot of people are just, reluctant to to engage um and that begs the question uh, you know is as we are social beings we're hungering for social engagement uh, why would someone shy away from that well <clears throat> i think as some of the folks here were alluding to um sometimes students don't feel safe sometimes they're shy they don't feel a sense of connection uh, online learning can be really intimidating uh, particularly for younger students um, and I'm going to move, I don't know if my Zoom window is blocking this, so I'm going to move it over here. Uh, students may feel that they don't know their classmates or their teacher, and their classmates don't know them, and, and thus it's, it's really difficult to overcome that shyness and, and speak up. But at the same time, as an instructor, building relationships can be time consuming. Uh, there's a lot of time sometimes that is required to overcome that, and uh, it's sometimes it's difficult to justify that in the face of limited teaching time. Well, there's uh, some good news when it comes to that, that exact question. How do we justify uh, spending time on just building relationships um, when we, we have to get through a certain amount of academic content? Uh, well, the, the uh, idea behind peer learning is that we can get students engaged with one another in a, um, in a functional way, in a collaborative way, in a positive way while they're learning. And uh, what I wanna do is provide a few key dimensions just briefly for peer learning, things that we need to think about when we're designing it and to really point out how it's different from a, um, a more informal approach where we may just put students in a breakout room and say, hey, go talk about this, go help one another. Um, as it turns out, those things may not be very successful. We have to be very thoughtful about how we do our, our small group learning. One of the things that we need to build in is incentive to collaborate. We want to make sure that students understand that they uh, are able to benefit by helping other students in their group. And in what way? We have to make that very tangible, um, make sure that there is a motivation on the part of each student to, um, to help others. And there's, there's different ways of doing this, different kinds of what we call interdependence that we can create. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. We also wanna make sure that every student has an important role in that group uh, and that we can hold them accountable for the role. And not only us as, as a teacher, but also their peers. Uh, when a student goes into a small group with an important role uh, and the group success depends on that student playing their role well, uh, then there's a lot of uh, peer expectations that come into play that can be very motivating. Let's see, where's my next one? There it is. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're developing a group skills, we're scaffolding uh, the skills that we want, we're, we're looking for them, and then we are um, recognizing and reinforcing those skills, really trying to supercharge um, the, the student's uh, ability to function and to thrive in small groups. And finally, we want to give our small groups an opportunity to process their experience, to reflect on what they did well, what they could do better next time, and then to give one another positive feedback. Uh, anything that a student did uh, that contributed to the learning of others should be recognized. 
this is a very much a, a positive behavior support kind of approach. And we want to make sure that there's lots of opportunities for that, not only the teacher recognizing student contributions, but also their peers. So when we are able to create small groups in this way, we can see a lot of benefits over a typical small group. Um, when a group is simply put into a breakout room, for example, without specific roles or without interdependence, uh, there can be confusion, there can be little incentive, uh, no accountability, students may not be familiar with each other yet, and we may get off-cast behavior, uh, we may get conflict, uh, reduced achievement, uh, and, and sometimes that those small groups can be a negative experience. Uh, when a student, for example, has to take on all the work and the other students are not contributing, uh, that, can, um, that can harm peer relations. When we structure those small groups very carefully, we give students uh, important roles. We make sure there's incentives and accountability. Uh, we can do things like explicit turn-taking uh, to make sure that students are um, each contributing uh, equally. We can even build in mutual disclosure so that students have an opportunity to share something about themselves while they're learning. And we find that this creates interest and engagement among the students. They uh, are more likely to support one another. Uh, and these design concepts, research suggests, will create higher levels of achievement and positive social relations. So we can actually build um, those relations among students while they're learning. Now, there's some evidence for this. As I mentioned, there is actually quite a bit of research on peer learning or cooperative learning and its ability to promote achievement, promote positive peer relations, and then some of these downstream effects as well, as you might imagine. Uh, mental health uh, being one of them. This is actually an, just an example. I find this to be a really, really interesting example. This is a, uh, a meta-analysis, which is a study that incorporates all the research that this individual could find. His name is John Hattie. He's actually down in Australia. He tried to assemble a list of all the different influences on student achievement and to quantify the size of the effect that each one had. Uh, how large of an effect uh, can we expect from different kinds of inputs into student achievement? Uh, and he found 252 different influences. As it turns out, a form of peer learning called jigsaw method, method is so powerful that it was number seven on the list. Uh, other things beneath that include prior ability and self-efficacy, uh, which are we all know as educators, a student's prior ability and their belief in their ability to su succeed are, are powerful influences. And sometimes students come in with uh, deficits in those areas. As it turns out, the jigsaw method is even a more powerful influence on student achievement than those things. Uh, and so we can see how the proper application of these techniques can help us as educators to overcome any limitations that a, a student may have in their background. Uh, that's how powerful this technique can be. Now, in addition to just learning, uh, there's a lot of other skills that students can develop in these small groups. When they are working together well, when they are collaborating, they're developing a really important skill set. Uh, as we all know, uh, part of our economy, a big part of our economy is working together with other people. Uh, and these are really, really important skills, perhaps just as important as the academic skills that they're taking away. And so we can uh, build those kinds of skills experientially with students while they're learning if we can apply um, well-designed small group instruction. Now I wanna get into a little more depth uh, and I, we're going to use a small group approach in order to do this. Uh, we're going to get into small groups of three or four. And, and so Brad, if you're able to put our participants into those small groups, we're going to learn a little bit more about uh, the different ways that we can apply uh, peer learning, the different concepts that we can apply. And everyone in the group will have a specific role. Uh, so just to clarify, those are on the right-hand side of the screen here. The manager uh, will have the earliest birthday in the calendar year. So if you're someone who has uh, January, February, March, April birthday, um, you're likely going to end up being a manager. I'm actually an April birthday. Uh, so share that with your team. The manager's role is simply to keep people uh, on task, make sure everyone is involved, uh, make sure that uh, you're moving through um, the, the, the document in an expeditious manner. 
the next birthday in the calendar year in your group will be the scribe, the person who is going to make notes on the group discussion uh, and the group consensus, and then uh, uh, be ready to present that when we get back in our large group. And then the analyst will be the person who is the last birthday in the calendar year. So if you're a Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas baby, then that's probably going to be your role. Uh, the analyst is someone who is going to um, make sure that everyone is on the same page, make sure there is consensus, bring up um, alternative ideas, bring up uh, issues that may contradict the group's thinking, uh, probing, questioning, that kind of thing. Uh, so the analyst is, uh, is there as sort of the uh, a devil's advocate, really, trying to make sure the group is considering all the possibilities before they, they come to their answer. So what I'm going to do is put a, a document, <clears throat> excuse me, into the chat window, and that'll be the basis for this exercise. So let me pull that up. Uh, let's see, your computer. And I'll put that in the chat window. Hopefully everyone will be able to access it. Let's see. It's called Peer Learning Lesson Examples. And if people have trouble getting it out of the chat window, I can certainly email it to you. Does everyone see it? Is everyone able to download it? And just to help people remember, I'll take those, those roles and I will put them into the chat window as well. So when you're ready for me to open the rooms, I will click open. Okay, I'm, I'm looking to see if there are any raised hands or, or um, any concerned faces that are not able to get access to that document. It has some material for you to read. Um, and you can certainly read it together or you can read it on your own, but then please come together in your small group and start to address the questions that are there and we'll have 15 minutes. Where did you say the document is? In the chat window. Do you see the chat button on the bottom of your screen? Yeah, but I don't see a document. Okay. Well, let me put it in there one more time. I, others don't see it either. Oh, there it is. Okay, I put it in a second time. Is there anyone who, who is yet unable to see it? We're just downloading it now. The second uh, piece right. worked. Good, it's called Peer Learning Lesson Examples. Uh, and I know that there are certain limitations with sharing documents in the chat if you're using a uh, smartphone, I think, uh, is one of the situations in which that can be a problem. I don't see anybody looking like they're on a smartphone here, though. But it's, it, it's possible that you may be. And if so, I can email it to you. If you're, I'll, I'll put it in one more time. And if it's still not accessible, um, then uh, simply put your email address in the chat and I can send it to you. Or as somebody suggested, when you get in your small group, you can ask someone to email it to you as well. Okay, I see a couple email addresses, so I'll send it right away. Um, and I think we're ready for our, our small groups then, Brad. Okay, um, so I, I have opened up screen share for the room, so if people want to screen share as well, um, that is available. So I'm gonna open all rooms. Um, Mark, if you don't want to go in the room that you're assigned to, just don't go into it quite yet and we can put you where you okay. need to be. And we'll have 15 minutes, so we'll be back at five minutes after the hour. Great, off we go. Welcome back, everybody. I apologize for the brief time that we have. Um, there's really so much here um, to talk about, and, and I was really in, enjoying some of the conversations that I was uh, a part of, and I wish we had more time. I really do, but uh, of course, we, we've promised to get you out of here in nine minutes, uh, and so I'm hoping there are a few people who are willing to share their, um, some of their conversation that they were having in their small group uh, around some of these topics. 
I'll jump in here first. Uh, so I'm Pam. I am one of the administrators for an online program in BC. Um, we had a wonderful discussion about how can we do this within an asynchronous type of activities uh, and an asynchronous program. Uh, and the challenge for those students of missing out on those informal discussions that would happen in a face to face setting and you know different ways that we could try to do that based on the plat. We also talked about uh, the different platforms that we use and, and what works for students, you know, and allowing them to kind of go outside to a different platform when they are doing their collaborative work and their peer to peer work. Um, and I love the notion, I think it was Nicole who had talked about she's an online coach that is actually supporting the teachers with their pedagogy to incorporate these kinds of things as much as possible. So it was a great discussion. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. It is, it is definitely true that asynchronous makes it challenging to connect. Um, and uh, there were lots of great ideas in that conversation about how to potentially overcome that. And I love the idea of the check-in, um, but I would, you know, being a, a social psychologist, I would advocate for incorporating more synchronous um, and getting students interacting while they're learning. Um, uh, of course, the interaction around fun topics is super valuable as well, um, but you don't have to stop there. Are there others willing to share in the brief time that we have left? Um, I'll share just quickly. We, it seems like the four people in our group that our programs have kind of all exploded this year and are in the midst of some big change. And um, it was more like philosophically, we see these things as being useful, but we haven't had an opportunity to use them yet. <laughs> right, right. And I think what you'll find, and I don't know if this is an, a common experience as well, is that trying to do a well-designed peer learning lesson with roles and, and with uh, accountability and with uh, you know keeping track of, of the status of every group and scaffolding social skills and all of this, I mean, that's difficult to do in some of the video conferencing platforms. They haven't really been set up for that. Uh, and they really certainly encourage a more didactic approach, uh, much more so than a student-centered approach. Uh, I don't know if anybody has, has had that experience, would like to jump in or, or if, if folks have other thoughts from their group I was, they'd like to share. Um, I was going to mention too um, that with this technology, we also have the ability to include parents as part of the community building aspect of it. And I was thinking in terms, we were in our group, I was talking about the whole base group idea. Mm -hmm. And instead of having just the student be checking in with one another, we can also have parents as Great either idea. parent students based groups or just even parent based groups right on their own because mm -hmm. they're all alone in this process too and feeling very isolated in terms of their knowledge of of this yep. type of learning so yeah great idea i love it a base group that incorporates parents fantastic obviously there'd be some logistical challenges getting you know parent schedules but yeah i think it's a great idea um who else would like to share real briefly here before we wrap up. In our group, we talked about the jigsaw technique and um, just wanted to look at that one because it was so high up on the, on the list of different possibilities and things like that. And um, for myself in my role, um, I'm, I'm training teachers a lot of the time. So one of the takeaways for me was, you know, when I'm teaching techniques like this to teachers, you know, to be able to model it and, and try it out, just kind of drawing on what George said that, you know, you're, you have more credibility if you've mm -hmm. actually tried it and you see what works and what doesn't. And um, sort of building those two concepts together as well, we kind of talked about how it might, one of the drawbacks might be that some children are uncomfortable sharing and yet sharing, you know, like George said, you know, try to work with them in their comfort zone. And yet mm -hmm. sharing and presenting is such an important skill that they need to learn. So, yep. you know, to try to take those two yep. parts and and be able to hear where they're at and and take them yep. to the next level. Yep, yep, yeah. Actually, that's that's a, a great point. Um, as a, educators, we have to balance that. Um, students may not be comfortable playing a role in a jigsaw and teaching their peers right right now. Maybe we can build them up to that, but we definitely don't want to let them opt out or something because those are incredibly valuable skills. As you said, the idea of reading and synthesizing and organizing and then verbalizing um, is a whole different level of learning. 
um, than simply sitting and listening to a lecture, for example. So um, I agree, it, it can be challenging for some students, but we do our best and we, we definitely want to, um, to advocate for, for them to, to take on those kinds of responsibilities. So um, we're almost out of time. And again, I apologize, this is such a short time frame, and there's so many different things that we can get into. Uh, I would really love to um, it, continue this conversation with people who are interested. And it doesn't have to be right now because I know people are off and running in different places. Um, the, the third bullet here is really the key. Um, this is a research area that I've been involved in for years. There's lots of different resources and tools uh, that you can use to deliver these kinds of instruction. Um, there's different things that I could uh, provide to you that you could use for uh, teacher education, professional development. Um, there's different uh, examples that I can send you about how these things can be structured. And I'm even got, uh, working on some technology that is designed from the start to support these kinds of uh, approaches to learning much more so than something like Zoom, for example. And I'd be happy to share that as well. Uh, my email address is on this uh, slide, just mark me at uorgan.edu. Um, I can certainly stick around here if people would like to continue the conversation or sim simply drop me an email and I'm happy to, to connect um, offline uh, some other time and, uh, and talk about the kinds of things that I could help you with. What are your challenges and, and what resources could I provide you to, to help you advocate for these kinds of practices? Because the, as we've seen and as people have testified, these practices are incredibly valuable, but they're complicated. And, and some of the technologies that we use like Zoom don't really lend themselves to them. And so there are definitely ways to do that. Uh, and, and as uh, I think it was Sandra was saying, we want to try and model these things uh, as, as, we're, um, as we're training teachers, as we're working with, with teachers, for example, we want to show them how this can work and how it can result in a better experience for the students. So um, with that, uh, let me just open the floor for the next minute or two. And if there's any questions or comments or um, feedback. Um, one question, or I'm sort of just talking and thinking at the same time here. Um, so in, in my, when I was a traditional classroom teacher, you knew you assign roles because you kind of know the kids a little bit, right? Like who could be the leader of this and who might be more comfortable as the note taker or who maybe needs the challenge of stepping up a little bit. And I, I would feel so lost in an asynchronous course where you don't, mm. I mean, I can look at students work and kind of know where they stand as a student, but interpersonally, when you're not having those face-to-face -face communications, how can we assign these roles with very, very little information on the student's personal, like, I don't know, is there a tool that we could use, like, in a, like a personality assessment tool or something that we could use to help us mm. with that? I don't know how that would work. Yeah, excellent question. I, I wonder, I bet there is. Um, there are probably offline ways that you can, um, find out more about your students. That's, that's an excellent idea. You know, it's possible that you could give them a personality test or something like that. They, they might actually consider that to be fun. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with these different dimensions of our personality. Um, I think there's four dimensions, uh, four axes, uh, and you can find online quizzes for that. Um, so why don't I find some of that? Nicole, if you, I'll put my, um, I'll put my email in the chat and, uh, yeah, definitely let me know if, if there is, um, if you'd like me to pursue that and send you some stuff, um, by all means, um, get in touch. I bet we could, we could find something um, that would work for you. I think that would be super cool. And the students would probably enjoy it too. Learn, you know, teach them a little bit about themselves. So yeah, I, I could, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look around and then uh, if you wanna pursue the conversation, just get in touch. Uh, we're at time, so um, feel free to uh, exit stage left if you've got other things to do. If, you if you'd like to continue the conversation, uh, I'm happy to stick around. And uh, I can certainly start to put resources into the chat window or I can email things to people uh, if you just let me know what you'd like uh, or how I could help you. Uh, again, I do professional development uh, all the time with teachers trying to um, get them to take up these techniques. And so there is a lot more detail that I can help you with. For example, the different kinds of interdependence, um, the different ways we can do individual accountability. 
uh, the different ways we can scaffold social skills. So I'd be happy to send you those resources uh, if you just get get in touch, or I could I could I could put them in the chat now if people would really like to get their hands in them ASAP. I'd like just to uh, take a moment just to thank you, Mark, for sharing your expertise uh, on behalf of the Candy Learn and Symposium. Um, I will be able to keep this room open for another three minutes, and unfortunately, we'll have to close it. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, that has to happen. Yeah, um, no problem. We'll take it offline. No problem. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much for sharing all of your uh, experience as well as uh, everyone else for their collaboration in the groups and everything. It's been uh, very valuable. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, if nothing else, I hope I've piqued interest. Uh, and I really hope that people get in touch to follow up if, if they would like to, to work together. Happy to support any efforts that people make to implement these techniques because they are so, so valuable, so powerful, so important. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, enjoyed talking with all of you. If you would like me to get in touch with you, just put your email in the chat before you leave. <laughs>